Miss Broadley, we've talked about making this video for some time and the 60th anniversary of the League this year seemed to be a good opportunity to actually get down and do it. Um, and it's also your 88th year, I think, isn't it? Yes, that is so. Um, so you were born in 1903? Yes. Into quite a, a comfortable family, I think. Is that right? Yes, into a comfortable middle class background. In, in Surrey? In Sussex, in East Grinstead. And what did your father do? Um, my father was a gentleman's outfitter. Um, he was the son of a Methodist minister who had four sons, and he made all of them gentlemen's outfitters in turn. Yes. And your mother was from the same sort of background as well? Uh, yes. My, uh, my mother had taught music before she was married. Yes. So you were all taught to play the piano and the organ, I think? Well, we, yes, we were all taught to. We were taught to read and play the piano simultaneously. Yes. Now, I think that you told me on a previous occasion that you learnt to drive when you were quite young. Is that so? Yes, yes. I, I learnt to drive as soon as I left school. That's very unusual. That was very unusual for that time, wasn't it? Yes. My father bought a car in 1910 so that we were motoring earlier than a lot of people. Yes. And when my brother had a motor, bicycle, I rode that as well. Mm -hmm. Would you say then that you were an independent sort of child, young woman? No, I would have said decidedly not, because my mother in particular was a very rigid disciplinarian, and it was a strict nonconformist family, and I think we were probably kept better in hand than most families. Yes. So when you came to train at the London, you were quite used to the discipline that there was in the preliminary training school? Yes, because um, the only school in East Grinstead was a convent school. My father had been sent to boarding school at eight and was firmly set against his children being there so that Convent school education, although we were Methodists, was the only thing available, so that I'd been disciplined at home and at school. Yes. What age were you when you came to the preliminary training school at the London? Just 20. And that was a normal age to start preliminary training? The nominal age at all the big hospitals was 21. Yes. And I'd had an interview at Guy's and they'd told me to go and do children's training and then go back and reapply. And what attracted me to the London was that they would take me at 20, whereas the others were still waiting for 21. Yes. What do you remember most about your interview to gain a place here? I think probably what made the most impression was that uh, we were medically examined by a doctor in matron's office with matron watching. It was an extraordinary way to conduct a medical examination. <laughs> and having satisfied them that you were in every other way suitable, the last step was how long would it take you to grow your hair? Yeah. And short hair at that time was not just short, it was very short. Yes. But I had only just left school and they considered short hair was fast at school, so I hadn't even had time to cut it. I didn't have to grow it. But you had to part it in the middle, didn't you? That was when we arrived at the preliminary training school. Yes. Now, when you, in the preliminary training school, it was theory only, wasn't it? Six weeks of theory. Is that correct? Yes. Six weeks of theory totally segregated from everybody and everywhere else. Yes. With no contact with anybody else. No. It was a horrid shock on arrival. The sister in charge greeted us each in turn with, hello, nurse. Well, we didn't consider we were nurses. And then each of us in turn was conducted to a miserable single bedroom with no counterpane, no carpet, 
no curtains. And the sister said, unpack your trunk, put it outside the door, change into uniform, part your hair down the middle and come downstairs. And I can remember thinking, whatever have I done? Yes. How long was it before that feeling left you, before you felt as if oh, you did well, the right thing? Having gone downstairs, I found there were the other 32 of us, all in exactly the same state. Yes. And none of us had hair that naturally parted down the middle. No. And you were all numbered, weren't you? Yes, we were numbered 1 to 32, and uh, our rooms ran 1 to 32 around the place, and we sat at meals, two long tables, 1 to 16. So you were number 11, and therefore, I suppose, the people that you spoke most to and got to know most were, were 10 numbers and 10 and 12. 12. And number 10 was born on the same day as I was. That's an amazing coincidence. Yes, and she and I were lifelong friends from then on. Yes. Now, you were, here, you were at the preliminary training school at Tredegar House for six weeks. So when did you actually come to the London Hospital Whitechapel? We had six weeks tuition and a week's examinations. And on the conclusion of those week's examinations, we came up to the London. Now, we'd been coming every day for our lectures at the London. The classroom was over the laundry. Yes. And we'd had most of our lectures there. And we'd also been brought to a lecture in the medical college every Wednesday night because they were short of nurses and we were putting being put straight into the first year class yes. before we even got here. When you came to start nursing here, you went to Sophia Ward, didn't you? Mm -hmm. what were the, who were the nurses on Sophia Ward? Were they staff nurses, probationers? Perhaps you could tell us what the makeup of the ward staff was. Well, the ward staff consisted of a sister two staff nurses who alternated three monthly doing day duty and night duty, so that there was a sister and a staff nurse on day duty. There was a senior nurse known as the probationer staff nurse who stayed in the ward for six months, and there would be anything up to five or six probationers as well. Yes. For a 28-bedded ward? For a 28-bedded ward. So do you think it was well staffed? Looking back, yes, I do. It was adequately staffed. Yes. There was at that time only one ward maid, so that we did the sweeping yes. and all the washing up, mm. because one ward maid in 28 beds could do very little beyond the fireplaces and the outside places. Yes. Now, the ward maids were an interesting group of people, weren't they? Perhaps, perhaps you could tell us a bit about the ward maids. The ward maids were local women. They were mid mostly middle-aged married women. They'd mostly worked for the hospital for years. Yeah. They were their sis the sister's right-hand man. I know when I became a ward sister, I could cope with my staff nurse's holiday, but my ward maid's holiday was terrible to deal with. Yes. And most of the ward maids stood between the junior probationer and authority. They more, really more or less mothered them. Yes. What about Sister? What sort of a figure was Sister? Was she a friendly figure, a figure of fear? Or how did you regard her? Well, I think a figure of fear rather than a fear rather than friendly. Yes. I think that we had a very wholesome respect for the Sister. Yes. And. What exactly was her role on the ward? Was she, did she manage the ward in, in every respect? She was monarch of all she surveyed. Yes. Um, she was responsible for the patients. She was responsible for the administration of the ward, so that she was responsible for the linen, for the stores. It was she that ordered the patients' meals. And she was also left where she was for many years, and they were, those experienced ward sisters must have been a tremendous value to the medical staff. Yes. 
Was there ever a feeling, do you think, that perhaps some of them stayed too long in the one position? Well, I'm inclined to think they probably did, but I don't think it was said. You must remember that this was immediately post-war, and there was no hope of marriage or promotion for the women who were well into their 20s. Yes. After all, a million men had been killed. There were a million spinsters. Yes. One other thing that we've talked about on other occasions is the very long working day that you had. Perhaps could you tell us a bit about the working day? Well, the rising bell went at a quarter to six. I don't think anybody ever heard that after the first week, but that was when we were called. We had to report to breakfast at half past six. And it is a fact that when conduct appears on a nurse's certificate, the only ones who ever got excellent were those who never in three years were once late for breakfast. Yes. So that we reported to breakfast at half past six. We were on duty in the wards at seven. Sister came on duty at half past eight, by which time we cleared away breakfast, swept and dusted the ward, made the beds, brought the flowers in. The whole place was completely finished. Sister would survey her staff, and half would be on duty in the mo that morning, and off from two to five in the afternoon, and the other half would be off from nine till twelve. And that meant that at five o'clock in the evening, when you came to the evening work, the whole staff was there. Yes. And the night nurses came on duty at 20 past nine, and we had to be in supper by half past. It was a very hard working day, wasn't it? It was a 15 hour day, yes. yes. Though my impression is that you were well looked after in many respects, the food was good. The food was good, and our health was inspected. There were home sisters in the dining room when we had our meals, and they knew perfectly well if anybody wasn't well and wasn't eating. Yes, but I think it affected you quite badly, didn't it? Because it took you four years to complete a three-year course. Well, I picked up every infection I came in contact with. Yes. I had English and German measles, scarlet fever and diphtheria in the course of three years, which took a year. That may have been because of the long working hours, mightn't it? It may have been a result of tiredness. Um, our local GP was convinced that if I'd had a bit more sleep at night, I shouldn't have caught all that infection. Yes. And it was not uncommon, was it? There were No. The nurse's sick room was always full. Yes. And uh, I suppose a lot of them really were completely overdone. A lot of infection, infected fingers and things like that. Yes. When you finished your training, what was the next step? The fourth year was compulsory and the nurse had no say as to whether she worked on the London Hospital's private nursing staff or whether she had a staff appointment in hospital. The London had the best private nursing staff in the country and they had about 200 people on the st private staff Yes. and there were always a certain number of fourth year nurses. Yes. Well, now, when I came back from my month's holiday, I was to go on the private staff and I was very disappointed and Miss Monk said that with a year's sick leave I couldn't expect to come into hospital. Now Miss Monk was the person who succeeded Miss Luckers as matron, wasn't she? Yes. Mm. What sort of a person was Miss Monk? I think if you really knew, she was probably a very shy woman. As far as we were concerned, she was very intimidating. But uh, I've always thought, looking back, that she was probably as terrified of us as we were of her. And to follow a matron who'd been there 40 years can't have been easy. No. It must have been very difficult for her to stamp her authority and her character on the place. I would have said that it would have been hopeless. Yes. Because all the sisters 
had been under Miss Luckers. Two sisters told me, me that if Miss Luckers was still matron, she'd send me packing. You know, that was, that was the standard. Yes. But Miss Monk was very keen to get nursing onto a professional basis. Yes. She did a lot with the College of Nursing. Now, she was also very keen for state registration, wasn't she? Yes, she may have been keen for state registration, but it didn't filter through to become state registration, even being encouraged. Now, Ms Luckers had been uh, against state registration, so when did it filter through to the London? Well, now, when I came to the London, you had one year's tuition, so that one year of your three, you were attending classes, and you had four hours theory a week for one year. And we started that the day we came into hospital, which meant the, final, the following July, we took the hospital final examination, and Mary and my, my, Mary and my twin and I, put our textbooks in the top of our wardrobes and considered we were now finished and trained. And then somebody down the corridor said, but there's this preliminary state examination. Now that was an enterprising nurse and we, we took it. But as far as the hospital cons was concerned, they were not interested in us becoming state registered. So it was quite a fight, in fact, to to get your state registration. It was frowned upon here. It was frowned upon, um, and you did it entirely at your own expense and in your own time. Yes. And uh, one of my set failed the preliminary state and she had to go to apologize for her, to Matron for having done so. Yeah. And in, certainly in Miss Monk's time, there was no attempt made to introduce state registration. So it came very late, in fact. It came very late. Yeah. In fact, it wasn't until 1948 that the very last sisters took the final state examination because they couldn't be kept on as sisters unless they were state registered. Once the health service had come in, the National Health Service. Now, do you think that this uh, the attitude to state registration held the London back in any way? The London... When Miss Luckus died, the London went into a state of hibernation and it didn't really emerge again till Miss Claire Alexander was appointed matron. Yes. What possessed them? not only to appoint the assistant matron as matron, which became Miss Monk, and then when she retired again to make matron of her senior assistant, it's extraordinary. I think that would be quite an interesting subject for a piece of research. A well, I think piece. actually the simple truth was that Lord Nutsford felt that he was too old to train a young matron. Possibly, yes, he was growing old. But it was then. not a good thing for the London. No. Now, shall we go back to your career? You were trained and you had been told by Miss Monk that because of sickness you had to go as a private nurse. And so you went out into the homes of middle-class people to nurse them in their own homes. Middle-class or upper-class, because... The nurses, the London Hospital private nursing staff nursed everybody from royalty downwards. Yes. I think you had quite an interesting experience, didn't you? My very first case, I was sent out in the evening to an old man who was unconscious and he already had two nurses. So that I arrived at a, out in Hampshire on a foggy night. I was met by a Rolls Royce. I'd never been in a Rolls Royce before, and I was most impressed. It was an old house, and they had neither gas nor electricity upstairs. And I was received by the other two nurses. The old man was unconscious. 
and they said they were both tired and they would go to bed and that all I had to do was to keep an eye on the old man and keep the fire in. And if I hadn't been so incredibly green, I would have poked round the house a bit and insisted I, that I knew where the kitchen was, but I didn't, I just said, oh yes. About midnight, the old man started regaining consciousness, and at 3 a.m., when he was writhing round in his bed, the lamp went out. And there I was in the dark in a strange house with a semi-conscious patient. And I decided then and there that everybody else got private nurse, but not me. <laughs> and how did you get yourself out of that situation? I remembered that in my bedroom, there was a candle and some matches. I wasn't very sure of the geography of the landing, so I crawled round it, and if I could hear breathing beyond the door, I didn't go in. <laughs> And I finally got to my bedroom door and I got my candle and I nursed him by candlelight. <laughs> it sounds like a detective novel. Um, you had how many months as a private nurse? I was on private staff for a year, but a good two months of that I was in the light department. Otherwise known as the gossip box, I That's think. That's right, and yes. And why was, was that? Well, it was always a mix of private nurses because they'd be some of them very senior private staff nurses and some of us brand new and incredibly dull you know you just sat and gave patients treatment for an hour at a time and if they didn't gossip to one another what would they have talked about so they were gossiping about their experiences as private nurses not over the patients and um, what happened about the light department patients were largely children. Yes. And you had to keep the lens through which the rays went free of the area below it, free of blood. And they used to use probationers, and a probationer had gone to sleep and a child had been burnt. And so it was entirely staffed by trained nurses. But you had got to keep the child sufficiently interested to keep him still during that hour that he was being given the treatment. So you had to talk to the child? Yes, it was just plain monotonous. Yes. So after your year as a private nurse, you joined one of the wards as a staff nurse? Yes, I became staff nurse in Charrington. Perhaps could you tell us a little bit about life on Charrington Ward? And it, on what date is it now? It's 1926? 1928. Yes, 1920, 1928. 1928. So yes. it's eight years. Um, five, five years. Five, five years, years since yes. you came to the London. It took me five years to become a ward, ward staff nurse. Yes. Charrington was the best run medical ward in the hospital. Sister had been made um, in charge there since 1904. And she was a very efficient, placid, um, wo woman, and it was a delightful place to work in. What about the patients? What sort of people were the patients? Socially or socially. diagnostically? So socially. Socially, the majority of our patients were local. Of course, they were all white. There was no colour at all in Whitechapel. No. Um, they were, well, they were typically top Cockney patients, most of them. We were beginning to get a few from a little bit further out, but um, most of them were. And I would have thought that some of them were um, immigrants as well. There was a wave of Russian Jews, yes. so that we had a lot of Hebrew patients. Yes. And were they treated differently? There were two Hebrew wards with 28 beds in each where all the Jewish customs were observed. But of course, not by no means all the Jewish patients could go to them. And the rest were nursed in the ordinary wards. Yes. And we did our best to respect their beliefs. Yes. On the other hand, they were extremely grateful. Mm -hmm. 
they were not demanding in any way. And what about language problems? No, they all struggled with the English. Yeah, so we all knew the odd, the odd word or two, but that was all. Yes, um, and medically, what sort of cases were you looking after? Um, well, the the heart patients um, and the chest people, and we get a lot had a lot of diabetics. Yes, the first insulin was being given when I first came up to hospital. Yes. So that insulin was well established by the time I was a staff nurse. Mm -hmm. Was Sir Henry Souter practising at the London during your time on yes. the ward? Yes. Um, did you have any first-hand experience of him at work? Yes. Yes, I, uh, he had, um, I took the sister's holiday in the ward where he had his men's beds. Yes. And what sort of a person was he? Well, you know, it took us a long time to accept that the chiefs were ordinary men. <laughs> they were all gods to us. Yes. And uh, we might have found some of them more approachable than others. And I think he was one of them. Yes. Um, he would have had quite a large team of students and junior doctors around him, wouldn't he? Well, yes, because his was the very beginning of uh, neurosurgical work. Yes. Um, and the, what was the relationship between the nurses and the doctors? The sisters, um, the sisters were on duty very long hours. So that as far as nurses and doctors concerned, I would as far as said that on the wards, it was the sisters and the doctors. The professionally, it was the doctor and the sister. It didn't concern the nurse very much. Yes. Um, whenever you have a lot of young men and young women, you can make whatever rules you like, they still get friendly with one another. They always have and they always will. So there were rules to try to keep them apart? Yes. Um, now, I remember a young sister being unfrocked and made a staff nurse of because she got engaged to a houseman wasn't considered suitable to have a sister engaged to a house surgeon. And so she was put on the private staff to finish her time. That was very strict, wasn't it? Well, it was ridiculous. Yes, yes. On and the other hand, very few people would have been so honest to let anybody know. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was... So presumably the doctors and nurses were mixing outside working hours. What were the social facilities like? I should have said no. But you had tennis courts, didn't you? Yes. But then the tennis courts, um, there were two tennis courts for the nurses, but there was also around one the other side, one around the other side for the doctors. There was no mingling. Ah. So it wasn't possible to have a, mix, uh, a game of mixed doubles? Oh, no, nothing like that, no. no. What about the garden, the nurses' garden? Was that only for nurses? The Garden of Eden, where no man might sit. <laughs> no, that was absolutely strictly. And you see, that was kept locked, and the porter at the back gate had the key, and he let you in. Yes. And when were you able to use the garden? Any time you wanted to? Oh, yes, the garden was there for the nurses to use. And it was well equipped. It had hammocks and cushions and uh, gas rings. Yes. And you could take a picnic and spend the whole of your off-duty time there. Yeah. What else did, could you do when you were off-duty, apart from sit in the garden? Where did you go? Well, I think it cost tuppence to get up to Oxford Circus so that you could have a look at the West End shops. Didn't give you long there, but uh, because it was a very slow bus ride. And uh, 
then I and two friends used to go rowing on the, the park just across the way. In Victoria Park? Victoria Park, yes. yes. Nine pence an hour. That worked out the threatened seat. <laughs> How much were you paid? What was your salary? Our salary was £30 a year, which meant we get 